and attend the house. The FNAF 4 house is one of the most iconic houses of all time. Ok, probably not true, but it's the most iconic house in FNAF at least. And we only get to see it in FNAF 4, at least that's what we thought, until the Curse of Dreadbear DLC for FNAF VR Help Wanted came out. In that DLC's main hub where we select the minigame we want to play, or in my case, have to play, we can see two hills in the distance. Whenever there isn't a giant Dreadbear looking over you, you can see a house on the hills. Very similar to how we see the house in FNAF 4 screens. Not only that, but if you turn the game to blacklight mode, press the button on the monitor and then turn around to look at the car behind you for 10 to 15 seconds, you can see Glitch Tramp dancing on the hill next to the house. Well, on the other hill. And since people were confused about who Glitch Tramp was, this is probably Scott's way of showing that the FNAF 4 house is his and that Glitch Tramp is William Afton. But we all know that now 100% thanks to the man in room 1280 from the Fazbear Frights book in the flesh. In a 9 Dark Carnival. And the recently released FNAF spin off game, FNAF Security Breach Fury's Rage, which I just played on the channel. Click up in the top right corner to check that out. You fight as one of the four Security Breach anime against a slew of enemies. These enemies include the clown springtrap skin from FNAF AR's Dark Carnival event. And not only do we see the character, we can actually see the carnival in the background when they get introduced. At least in the level they get introduced. Clown Springtrap gets introduced in the second level to the game, I believe. And while scrolling through the streets, whenever the background isn't blocked by buildings in the middle, you can see the top of a tent, no doubt meant to be the carnival. Why there are so many Clown Springtraps, I don't know. Why they're after us, I don't know. And why we never see Magician Mangle or Ringmaster Foxy is another mystery. But it's still a nice little detail nonetheless. In today, eyeless animatronics. FNAF 1 has the famous eyeless Bonnie screen that can appear during hallucinations or when you die. However, I know some of you may not be aware that FNAF 2 actually has a similar screen, along with two others. Yes, FNAF 2 has three eyeless animatronic screens, all with a 1 in 1000 chance of appearing. These being eyeless Toy Bonnie, eyeless Freddy, and eyeless Foxy. It's interesting how Bonnie is the only animatronic to have two eyeless versions, and Chica doesn't have one at all. I don't know how this applies to the lore, if at all, or if they're just hallucinations that Scott added to make us look for more mysteries within the hallowed halls of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. But it literally is. But it's the only animatronic that doesn't have an eyeless version. Like Ch it's Chica. That's kind of interesting. Maybe it's because she was the first and has seen everything. Haha. <laughs> so she has that eyes because she's seen everything. <laughs> and it's seven mask switch. FNAF Sister Location is one of the more popular games in the series and has quite a lot going for it. Basically being a turning point in the series where the game started to revolve around the Afton family even more. However, at the top of the primary control panel through most of the game, you see what will become Ennard's mask. But every so often, for some reason it changes to Lulbit's head. I don't know why, but it can. And then it will switch back at some point. That's it, really. Don't know why it changes, since it can do so before Ennard is even created, but it happens. And it's kind of hidden if you don't look up there too often. So, there you go. And it's six, Lulbit Bit Butters. While the name of the number may entice anyone who is sad that the brawler game was not called Furry's Rage, this is not about any interaction of with Lulbit Bit to make butter. Rather, in fact, in FNAF VR we can collect coins that we use to unlock various prizes at the prize counter. Upon collecting all of the coins, an exotic butters basket will appear on the counter. On the bottom of the basket lies a button for some unknown reason. When pressed, however, you can see Lulbit Bit's screen appear on the monitor up and to the left of the prize counter. It's unknown why this happens, but it's still pretty cool and something not everyone will know about unless they watched someone play through the whole game and collected everything or have done so themselves. But I guess most of you will have either watched or done it yourselves. And there is at least one person who has clicked off this video at this point because it wasn't about Lulbit's butter. Halfway through it at number 5, Secret Poster. This is so secret even I don't know what it looks like, and I can't find any answers or images on Google. The FNAF VR DLC has a barn as its victory screen whenever you complete a game. When you win, you're brought to this barn, basically. However, there are three posters that can be one of three things. And in the distance, there is a fourth secret poster that never changes. But you can't really get a good look at it without boundary breaking. And since I can't do that, I'm forced to remain trying to squint and see what it looks like. I think it has to be some version of Chica for sure. Yo, what is, what is that poster? Is that Chica or something? I think that's Chica. This has been bugging me for so long that I actually might have to get the mod so I can move around just so I can know. It's not lore solving and it's not really that important, but it's a hidden detail that is still hidden to me. It bothers me to my core. And it's for radioactive. 
No, I'm not singing Imagine Dragons. I'm talking about another FNAF AR animatronic. This time talking about Radioactive Foxy from the Wasteland event, I believe it's called. This skin for Foxy makes him glow bright green and gives him a second hook on his right hand. As if he had two heads because ra radiation mutates things. Get it? Well, the character also has a radioactive symbol on him, and I don't care how crazy this world is, there is no way an animatronic got that symbol put on them with radiation. It's an animatronic, not an organic being. So even the two hooks would be impossible naturally, meaning that this character was created to be radioactive, and that's probably the scariest thing of all. At least Fazbear Entertainment is doing something normal companies do, like dumping toxic waste into animatronics or something like that. This seems more normal than sending out versions of your killer to homes with families inside. With all they've done, it's nice to see them do some actual normal company things. Gotta love capitalism. That's just proper grammar. Get it? Because capital letters? No, just me? Okay. And then three, coffee. In FNAF VR Help Wanted, you can see multiple animatronics. However, the most interesting one is probably the coolest hidden secret animatronic, and it's Coffee, which isn't even an animatronic from the FNAF series. It's actually from another one of Scott's games, which failed, like every other game before FNAF, unfortunately. At least until FNAF was successful, then the other games did well also. The game from which Coffee hails is called Desolate Hope, and in that game, Coffee is an autonomous service robot designed to tend to the needs of nearby humans. It basically is a sentient coffee machine that actually makes coffee. Welcome to Yogg Labs. Coffee can be seen in FNAF 3 if you reload the level enough times and he will be sitting on your desk, unable to be interacted with, and he won't actually make you coffee. Which sucks because, you know, when I'm freaking out, when a 60 year old dude trapped in an animatronic is coming after me, coffee will really settle my nerves. But I'll definitely need it if I'm working from 12 to 6, that's for damn sure. Imagine FNAF, but like, real time. Dear God. And it's two, Game Link. This easter egg was pointed out by MatPat in one of his timeline videos for Ultimate Custom Night, where he started the video spending 10 minutes downloading a fresh copy of both FNAF World and Ultimate Custom Night so that nothing had been unlocked yet. In FNAF World, you are able to dive deep into the game code and visit Old Man Consequences, who will say some things and then ultimately make you drown yourself before you can get out. This reveals a secret ending to the game and gives you a trophy for it. In Ultimate Custom Night, you are also able to visit Old Man Consequences, who tells you to leave the demon to his demons and rest your own soul. However, if you do this, you'll need to drown yourself again to leave the game. Doing this, while never even playing a second of FNAF World though, will unlock the Old Man Consequences trophy. Which is odd, but might be Scott's way of saying that the game is still canon. I mean, it did talk about sentient code, and that things in game can infect the real world, since you lay out the clues for FNAF 3, probably hinting at the fact that the game may be key in solving what the lore is going forward, since we're seeing the same sorts of things emerge. Sentient code, games affecting the outside world, and potentially working its way into ours. Finally, in a number one, it's me. There are only two people who have been able to get this easter egg to my knowledge, and it involves getting the Curse of Dreadbear DLC and completing a game to be taken to the Victory Barn. There you will find three posters reminiscent of the ones from the alleyway and pizzeria simulator. However, this is where the ability to unlock this easter egg is determined. You need to get three clown posters, which is incredibly rare, and I mean incredibly rare. Plus, you need to hit them all with darts, which you only get four of, and if you miss two of them, you're screwed. I've looked for this easter egg for hours on both my personal channel channel during live streams and on the live stream on this channel from before the previous lockdown since I want to find this myself and I want to so badly since if you manage to do this the barn changes to a seemingly black like version where the victory banner changes to read it's me and everything starts glowing because of the black light. YouTubers Johnny Blocks and apparently Daco are the only two to have gotten this easter egg from what I've seen and what I've been told in the comments. Not even MatPat was able to get this and Eddie VR wasn't really trying. I may have to keep live streaming the game until I find it but it's going to take me a while I'm sure and emotional part but this series already does that. And its end names don't matter. Scott Cawthon is the creator of the FNAF game, so I think that we can take his word for everything in the series. Unless he's trying to troll us at least. And in an interview, I'm pretty certain with Daco, he said that the names he gave the characters don't really matter. They they weren't there wasn't much thought behind it, especially in the first game. The names of Jeremy, Fritz, and Mike Schmidt don't really matter. Now, whether the names of all the characters don't matter is up for debate, since he after the first game wanted to tell a story, so we unfortunately can't throw away or confirm the Mike Schmidt Michael Adams connection yet. However, if you're currently looking into the meaning of those names, and maybe even names like Gregory or Elizabeth, maybe it's best to hold off on that until it's our only option. I personally don't think that we've presented every possible scenario yet, mostly because other people don't want to hear anything other than what's been generally understood right now. Like what we generally accept is what happened in FNAF, people don't want to hear something else. 
But hey, that's not my problem. And at 9, the books. The main series of FNAF books, those being The Silver Eyes, The Twisted Ones, and The Fourth Closet, don't have much connection to the actual games. They tell a different story, yet on another Earth or something like that. However, they are from the same mind as the games, so they do share common elements and they would have some hints to help us figure out the base series, because he'd already have a story in mind for that and he can't really just lose it entirely. But where the books really come in clutch is the Fazbear Fright series, a book series originally said to only have five books that ended up getting Getting itself some more. The Fazbear Frights books are, by Scott's own words, meant to help us solve various aspects of the games, and that's where these books come in handy. Without them, we wouldn't know how William always came back, or that he just never died until actually possessing the hard drive, and many, many more things. So maybe if you're looking for answers, these books are the place to go first. Also, because these stories are genuinely scary. And in a FNAF multiverse, I personally cannot wait for the FNAF Multiverse canon. I'm really interested to see where that canon story will go and if it will be easier to follow than the main FNAF story. The new universe, of course, being thanks to the Fazbear Fanverse initiative Scott has put together, helping fan game creators have funding to make additional games in their series or releasing new and updated versions for their old games, with popular series like Five Nights at Candy's getting another game, as well as The Joy of Creation getting a remade collection. But this also contains FNAF Plus a fan recreation of the first game which looks utterly terrifying and will serve as the start of that FNAF universe's timeline. If they used like the main games it would be complicated and like you it would, it would be weird, okay? Like from a lore perspective, like it would have to be the exact same thing and it would it would be weird. I love the idea of multiple Earths as I'm sure you all know, where anything you can imagine is literally happening on another planet and I think that that's really inspirational at times. Like you can literally do whatever you want, like whatever you set your mind to because it's happening somewhere already. You just gotta have it happen here too. Like how else am I supposed to find the motivation to take over the world? Honestly. And at 7, the apple tree. The saying goes the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and while that isn't always the case, it certainly became the case for Elizabeth in the FNAF series. Elizabeth being the daughter of the purple guy we all know and some of us love a little too much. You know, William Afton. Elizabeth, however, gets scooped on the first day of Circus Baby's Pizza World being open and gets the place shut down after a single day. She ends up possessing the animatronic in a story we all know too well, but she goes a little crazy while being an animatronic, willing to kill you in Sister location when the power goes out, and then, you know, killing Henry in FNAF World, which is kind of poetic in a way. Like father, like daughter in this case. William took Henry's daughter's life, and William's daughter took Henry's life which is weirdly beautiful but also horrible and this girl is out there chopping heads off and she like wasn't even old enough to make a club penguin account yikes and it's six stuck in the middle and to those of you who may be confused as to why it would have been elizabeth killing henry even though she was possessing baby at the time of his death elizabeth is still inside baby we can see it much like how we can see the body of someone else in funtime freddy's wireframe and the blueprints in fnaf 6. there is actually a body of a kid stuck inside baby as well and i don't know about you but i don't think that william would have taken his daughter's body out of baby since she had you know possessed the animatronic and then just like threw baby back out there to collect more kids instead of studying her even more. Like at this point, William already knew about Remnant, but he'd never seen it work. He'd never seen the possession work. He knew about it, but he didn't know about it, you know? But this time, it had something to do with his family. He had a personal stake in the matter. And the FNAF 6 wireframe is what Henry was using to lure baby back so that he could release Elizabeth, and doesn't mention any other kind of kid that would be trapped inside of Elizabeth or baby, or whatever, they're the same thing, so yeah. How are we doing at number 5? Fan art. Continuing on the FNAF multiverse idea, the whoopsie we know from the original cover art of FNAF VR Help Wanted could be in fact another addition to this multiverse. While not intended, the original cover art did contain fan art. The FNAF multiverse opens up this cover to actually being a reality. If anything, these could already be in theory canon, because it's been made and released. It's not some theoretical thing that could have happened, it actually did happen and there was a decent kerfuffle about it when the news first dropped. But at least it could be a way to get like a few more characters into the FNAF multiverse, which is definitely going to be a thing with the new FNAF games, and already a thing with the books and the upcoming movie. At least, at some point, because this thing is going to have us waiting longer than The Elder Scrolls 6, and that hurts me to say on a personal level. <laughs> Headed for Glitch Trap Conspiracy. 
Glitchtrap is the antagonist of the latest main series title, FNAF Help Wanted, the VR title that later got itself a flat version. However, he was supposedly an accident after being scanned in when they used a hard drive in order to make the AI of the animatronics. However, for an accident, this character is able to do an awful lot in game. He can interact with things like curtains and other sections of the game. Like, how is he able to do that if he was just an accident? Sure, they would have AI, but they would have had to code separate collision, right? Maybe not because like he's a spirit, but who knows? It just seems off to me like he had to have some form of help to get the control that he does in game. At least being able to interact with aspects of the game. Like he shouldn't be able to do that, right? Even we can't move curtains and stuff. The hard drive was just for AI, not collisions. And no other animatronics really move things other than Foxy and the camera in the DLC. Like from at least from what I've seen. Like, and the whole like, oh yeah, here, use this hard drive, it'll help you with the AI, that just seems shifty to me, I don't know, it's weird, okay? Something's going on there. Vanny wasn't around yet, so who did it? Who gave him the hard drive? Who did it? Which one of you, no one's going home until someone tells me who did it. And three, flash forward. One confusing part of the game lore to me is the death of Henry Emily, the father of the puppet and the one who set the fires in both FNAF 3 and FNAF 6, since he stays to burn in FNAF 6 so nobody will remember the horrors that occurred. But thanks to FNAF World's additional cutscenes after an update, where we see the introduction of Baby and the death of Henry, who we figured was Henry because he says he helped create the monster, which would most likely be referring to William or the animatronics, but either way, Henry helped. But like I said, if he dies in FNAF World, how is he alive? Live in FNAF 6. That, that, that couldn't have been Henry, right? Well, who else is at the FNAF 6 location? Baby. It could very well be that this is a flash forward to the FNAF 6 location even before Sister Location had been released, which is crazy and pretty cool. It also explains why Baby had to get kicked out of the Ener Tribe because she had to be a separate entity so that she could kill William, like that cutscene. And two, no sequels. This is fairly common knowledge, but it's something everyone seems to forget, and honestly, it's crazy to think about. The original game was meant to be Scott's final attempt at being a game designer after multiple games not taking off. But thanks to some incredible ideas, reviews, mysteries, and YouTuber support, the game blew up and got itself some sequels. However, since there was no intended sequel, the canonicity of the first game can be confusing. Does it matter? Should we ignore it? No. Because while it may be slightly outdated, Scott has said that the game still has significance and the game is still canon. What that really means is unknown, like if all the parts of it matter or if we should just keep an eye on this game since it will be needed to sort out the whole timeline. Like we don't know if all of it matters or if the things that don't conflict aren't canon. We aren't sure. Finally, in number one, the end. There was actually meant to be an end to FNAF. The Five Nights series wasn't intended on being more than one game as I said before, but after it got a sequel, the game wasn't going to be as long as we know it to be today. The story wasn't going to be as complicated and convoluted as it is now because the series was supposed to end after FNAF 3. The series was going to be fairly cut and dry. William kills five kids by luring them into the back room and then they get possessed. The restaurant closes and then reopens after sealing his springtrap body inside. He is then released and Fazbear Frights opens, but burns to the ground with him inside. And with FNAF 3 being the original ending, William would, would have died in that fire. And honestly, I would have loved that. No confusing crying child or big brother shenanigans, no convoluted timeline, but Scott ended up making FNAF 4 because the community was overall disappointed with the Springtrap jump scare, and he didn't want something that disappointed people to be the last game of the series. That's why the Nightmare animatronics are so terrifying, it's an overcorrection. And honestly, I understand, because like, I am too, I'm disappointed with it. Hence why I don't think that Springtrap is that as scary of an animatronic, but also because he isn't an animatronic, he's a dude in a suit, but still. So yeah, FNAF 3 would have been the end of the series if the Springtrap jump scare had actually been scary. So I guess we can thank William for our continued content and channel growth. Thanks, dude. Many, many lives have been sacrificed. <laughs> That's also from another interview of his. Number 10, Desk Man. Many believe that Desk Man is actually William Afton or Scott Cawthon. We don't know for sure, but he definitely seems to be someone who is meant to be either of those creators, just based on all the words that he says. Deskman at one point asks you about deactivating his games, which makes him seem like he's Scott, who makes games. However, at another time he tells you that it is too late to do anything as Baby is here and she can't be deactivated. 
deactivated, which makes him seem like he's actually William Afton. Duskman overall is definitely a mystery and secret just waiting to be solved. His death in the words he says could reflect the games or the lore depending on which role he's actually meant to resemble. Number 9. The show will begin momentarily. When you go to see Deskman, there is a direct reference to sister location that can be spotted, or rather, heard. You can hear the version of Circus Baby from FNAF World saying out loud, the show will begin momentarily, everyone please stay in your seats. While the lights are out, it's here that Deskman ends up being killed. We don't know if it's Baby that causes his death or whether he does so himself. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, just a quick reminder to please, please, please click like if you love this video. Anytime that you click like, you know we get a day closer to a new FNAF game. Actually, if we get a certain amount of likes, I think we get the new FNAF game like right now. I'm I'm just kidding, that's not gonna happen. But if you want more FNAF, you can also check out our playlist. Number 8. Instant Refight. Refight? Is that a thing? Now it's a thing. I made it a thing. You're welcome. For Pork Patch, who is one of the bosses in the game and is terrifying, by the way, there is a little secret that you might find useful while playing, which allows you to refight him immediately after you fail. If you fail. Hopefully you don't fail. Pork Patch just looks like some Franken pig animatronic, by the way, like an animatronic that may or may not have been made out of real pork, which is now like rotting away. I'm, I'm personally, I'm just, I'm a little disturbed. For the Pork Patch fight, there is a little shortcut you can use, sailing on your little lily pad around and down and hitting a button in the world to refight him again. And if you didn't know about that, now you know. Number 7. The Honking Sound Throughout the game franchise, there have been little easter eggs strewn about that allow you to create a honking sound, usually by clicking on something. In the first game, this would happen when clicking on the poster. In the fourth game, this would happen when you clicked on the plushie on the bed. In FNAF World, the nose honk sound also exists, and you can find it when clicking Freddy's nose on the title screen. So if you're wondering where that honk noise went and you were hoping it was somewhere in here, you can enjoy finding it right at the beginning of the game. Honk honk! It also kind of sounds like one of those noisemakers that rolls out. What are those called? A party favor? A party blower? A party horn? You know what I mean. The things. They roll out. Number 6. Finding the clock ending. This is an ending that you need to be patient in order to find. It will come up during a conversation with good old glitchy Fred Bear. You gotta wait for him to get glitchy by the way. But you can't exit out of that conversation. Don't exit out. Waiting a few moments will mean that you end up getting additional instructions, being told additionally to find the clock. The clocks are scattered throughout the game, with a few being located in the Mysterious Mine, one in Pinwheel Funhouse, another in Fazbear Hills, and one in Dusting Fields. There is a specific order in which you'll collect these clocks, starting with Fazbear Hills. Before you collect each one, you will receive additional instructions to help you know where to look, and each one can be activated by completing a puzzle or solving a game. You will then have to battle Pork Patch to receive the key, which gets you access to a warp circle, which takes you to this secret ending. So many steps. It's also believed that you need to play the game on hard mode to unlock this ending. Number 5. FNAF 4 Ending The clock ending will reveal the same character from when you first started the game. This character will reassure you that we are still your friends, but asks if you still believe that. This is similar to the ending that we see from FNAF 4, but instead of telling the player that they will put them back together again, they are instead told by the character who is obviously meant to resemble everyone's favorite psychic friend. Fredbear, but shrouded in darkness, that the pieces are in place for you, but you yourself will need to find them. This ending also gives you the Crying Child trophy, which is obviously another tie to FNAF 4. Number 4. Halloween Land Halloween Land is an update that was added to FNAF World. However, it is an area that you can only access after beating the game. It doesn't just appear as bonus content, unlike other game updates and bonus content. One of the ways you can find and access this area is to visit Deskman after beating the game. Once you talk to him and leave his home, Fredbear will appear outside and open up a portal for you. Oh thank you, how convenient. Moving through that portal takes you to Halloween Land or the Halloween Backstage Update area, whichever you prefer to call it. Number 3. Secret Graveyard Path In the graveyard there is a path that takes you all the way to the beginning of the game. This shortcut can be very useful, especially if you are trying to achieve certain objectives in order to unlock trophies, endings, 
games or other such achievements in game. Once you've unlocked Halloween Land, this path will also become available to you, if you can find it. In order to do so, you'll need to position yourself between two rocks near the windmill in Fazbear Hills. From there, move left until you hit a tree. If you continue to move left without stopping, you will eventually move through that tree, sort of phasing through it, and enter Halloween Land. Ooh, spooky. Number two, Old Man Consequences. This is an ending you have to get to in a very specific way. Okay, let's go. You have to get here by visiting glitches and moving in a very specific path to the fourth one. Once you access that glitch, it will take you to a sub tunnel with nothing but some trees, a lake, and a man who is fishing on that lake. This man appears to be glitch like himself and is red with jagged teeth and seems to be kind of shaped like a crocodile. This is Old Man Consequences. He will tell you that you have bottomed out in the coat and so this is basically the end of the line for you and you must just accept it. This is one of the alternate endings you can get, however if you've gotten every other ending in the game and been here multiple times before, it's actually possible to beat and kill Old Man Consequences who doesn't really put up a fight. I guess he's just at peace with his lot. He's like, we're at the bottom of the code, you're killing me, whatever. Number one, final boss. Although there are a myriad of endings in FNAF World, the secret and final boss for this game, the final final boss, can only be unlocked and beaten once you have defeated all four guardians and have played through the game on hard mode. Doing so will mean you can finally head to the red tent and enter it, which will allow you to approach the final boss fight. Who is the final boss in FNAF World? Why, it's none other than Scott Cawthon, of course. Well, Scott Cawthon does seem to have similarities or connections to Deskman in the game, which we talked about earlier. This is his real in-game version. Once you instigate the fight and face off with Scott in-game, he will tell you, it was fun being the puppet master, but now I grow weary. It is time to put you in your place. This fight is a tough one, by the way, but if you manage to succeed, Scott will use his dying breath to ask you, was this really the ending you wanted? Coming all the way here just to kill me? Was I really the villain in your mind? He'll tell you that he hopes you feel good about yourself killing him and ending the story by killing the storyteller. Bursting into pixels, the words, the end will then come up on screen. Number 10 Scrap Trap. FNAF Fury's Rage was probably the most fun I've had while playing a FNAF game. No scares, no intense lore to figure out, only a few bits here and there. One of those bits was the inclusion of Scrap Trap laying on the ground as presented in the FNAF 6 loading screen. The character is interactable and doesn't move, but this begs the question, is this where he was left? Is this the alley that we see him in in FNAF 6? And if it is, was the Dark Carnival behind it as it is presented in this game? Either way, whether it is or not, it's a cool easter egg and serves as further confirmation that the FNAF AR animatronics are canonical within the main game lore. Unless it's in a different spot, then maybe they aren't. Or maybe this is where he was before going to the FNAF 6 location since Henry had to lure him there. I don't know. It can give some implications though. It, it would be nice to get anything confirmed as canon at this point though. Honestly. And at 91985. The security panel code of 1985 from Sister Location revealing images of the FNAF 4 house is not a new thing. This has been known for ages and was used by many to confirm the events of FNAF 4 taking place in 1985. But this begs the question, where did these rooms come from? If this does confirm the events of that game taking place in 1985, why are the houses that we play in during the 8-bit and main gameplay so different? It could be an illusion since we know the animatronics are, but if that was the case how would the cameras be seeing that? And if these are two different houses, why? And what does that mean for the series overall? Hell, where is the parents' bedroom in the 8-bit house? There is a locked door in the living room, but is that uh, is that the room? And even if it was, where's the plush trap hall? This is one thing that has always bothered me about that game, honestly. And like I know, right? Really out of all things that bother me, that? Yes, it is. And it ate secret animatronics. While not being the main feature of any minigame, the mini arenas actually appear in FNAF VR Help Wanted, in the Plush Trap Darkroom. When loading into the game, you have a chance to see them in one of the doors. This is probably just a distraction tactic used to make things more difficult so you're more likely to get jump scared, but it's still damn well going to work, because it's such a rare thing that I want to look at it more and more. And you can also encounter a Biddy Bap doll in Baby's minigame. You know, the one where you need to close the closet doors in the FNAF 4 house, but not for too long, otherwise the Plush babies are gonna kill you. Yeah, you can see Biddy Bap near the door on rare occasions, and honestly, it's just kind of freaky. Also, can I just say that mini game must suck for anyone with pediophobia, which is the fear of dolls. Just, just solidifies everything that you fear. 
I still have to beat that game though. Like I think I'm prepared to play it for a video or a live stream, what have you, but then it actually starts and I instantly regret my decision to put myself in that situation. Like even if it was to find those animatronics, just no. Instant regret. And it's 787 days. This is fairly well known at this point, but there are some of you who are new fans to the series and don't quite understand how crazy this is. The first FNAF game was released on August 8th, 2014, a day after my friend's birthday nearly eight years ago. That game was a hit after being discovered by MAPAD as well, who really introduced many of us, if not most of us, to the series. The game did end up getting a sequel, obviously, in the form of the FNAF 2 prequel, which was released on November 11th, 2014. While you may not understand the intensity of that, that is hella quick for a game to be made from the start, even with the existing mechanics already in place, especially with all the new things we got in that game. However, the game was released 87 days after the first, which to anyone who knows the slightest bit of FNAF lore will instantly have alarms go off. 87 days? Like the bite of 87? Yes, exactly. That's just absolutely bonkers. <laughs> Not only did he make the game within that time, but he released it perfectly. I still don't know if it's a coincidence, but knowing Scott, this is the first in a long series of lore teasers and hints, and I find that absolutely astounding. And at 6, the box. The FNAF 4 box has, like the Bite of 87, been a pain in the ass to all FNAF fans. And those who try to explain things have been struggling for a while to explain what could be inside the infamous box. However, FNAF 6 might have given us the answer that we were looking for with its final speech. Henry's final speech from the true ending of that game. Take a look. I that you are trapped. Your lust for blood has driven you in endless circles, chasing the cries of children in some unseen chamber, always seeming so near. Did you see it? The layout of the FNAF 6 pizzeria is oddly similar to the layout of the FNAF 4 box. And stories from Candy Cadet talking about five things becoming one thing and then getting put into a box makes sense of this as well. Five animatronics, however you want to count it. Baby, Scrab Trap, Molten Freddy, The Puppet and Lefty, or Molten Freddy is most of them. However it works out, even if you include your character, five things are becoming one fire in the smoke that is Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. While William may have escaped, Henry sticks around. Maybe that's what the box is meant to represent. The box being reality and William being able to escape from it, become a frickin' virus, and then infect people's brains. Who knows, really? No, seriously, tell me who knows, because I, I, I need to know. Halfway through in at number 5, The Job. Going off this FNAF 6 existentialism, who was The Job meant for? In that same speech, we hear Henry talk about us finding the job even though it wasn't meant for us, and that there was a way out for us planned even though we don't want it. But him saying that it wasn't meant for us implies that there was someone who it was meant for, but who? If it was just anyone, he wouldn't have said that it wasn't meant for us, because it wasn't meant for anyone. Him saying that implies there was someone specific that he had in mind for this task, but who was it? Does Henry have a son? And he was going to use the speech at the end to say goodbye rather than scold the animatronics? Or was it meant for someone he trusts, perhaps his wife if she's still around? I like the idea that it's his son, who we never ended up seeing, but why wouldn't he just ask him instead of putting the ad out normally? I don't know. What do you think? Let me know down below. In it for L Chip. In the security breach G Force RTX trailer, we see many things, from the back rooms to the food court. And in that food court, we see a shot of its Mexican restaurant, with a statue of L Chip from FNAF 6 on the left, some cacti decorating the place, some air hockey tables in the back, presumably some other arcade games as well. That's probably the Faz Kids so that the kids can play while the parents finish eating. But we also see animatronics fly past us as they go off to serve some food. But as they pass us, we see an arcade game having something to do with L Chip in the bottom left of the screen. I can't quite tell what the game is, all I could make out is L Chip, but it should be some form of pinball or something, based on the shape of the machine at least. If you didn't already know though, L Chip is a Mexican themed beaver animatronic and is the mascot of L Chip's Fiesta Buffet in the Fazbear universe, and is a purchasable animatronic in FNAF 6's catalog. He will actually interrupt you with advertisements for his restaurant in Ultimate Custom Night, where you 
will need to mute him before alerting sound sensitive animatronics. And the character is presumably based on Chipper from Chipper and Sons Lumber Co, another one of Scott's games, where the idea of FNAF actually originated because someone said the characters looked animatronic. Nice little homage. Getting close to the end in a number three, Hospital Room. One of the common theories about what was going on in FNAF 4 is that what we were experiencing is in the mind of Crying Child, who was laying in the hospital because of a bite and who will die at the end of the game. This theory was first brought on by the easter eggs of an IV, a vase of flowers, and a jar of pills that can be visible next to the child's bed when the screen is brightened. Because we all know how much we loved to brighten screens. And now we're digging through source code and linking details in books. My, how far we've come getting kids to actually read. The vase, flowers, and IV are no doubt referencing the idea that we are truly waiting in the hospital and in a coma trying to cheat death. And thanks to the flat line we hear at the end of the game, however, we know we either don't succeed or are taken off the machine. This led to the idea that the whole game series is a dream, which was proven false thanks to the joke April Fool's Day mechanics of Nightmare Fredbear in Ultimate Custom Night. And it's two VR Sisters. The VR Sisters, as far as I know, were introduced into the FNAF series in Security Breach Fury's Rage. They're the bosses of Stage 1 and are fought again in Stage 3 as regular enemies. But my question is, who are they? They don't have names, they don't talk, they don't do anything other than fight us, but they wear VR headsets and have a kinda similar theme to the FNAF AR arcade animatronic skins. You know, VR Toy Freddy and High Score Chica being the most like this. And I mean like the blue and yellow grid patterns they have going on on their arms and legs. But that could also just be leggings and sleeves and not their actual body. The thing is, we don't know who they are if they're human or if they're animatronic. And at this point, it's up for debate and I don't even know if it matters in the long run. It could totally be for nothing. These characters could mean nothing to the story. We could see them in the full security breach or they could fade away into nothing. It bothers me, clearly. Finally, in a number one, Matt Pat. I've mentioned this in other lists, but Map Hat, or at least the Game Theory YouTube channel, is actually canon in the FNAF series, thanks to the Fazbear Frights books. I can't quite remember which one, if someone knows maybe they can tell me in the comments, but at one point a character says that's just a theory, and then the book proceeds to describe it as like their favorite YouTuber, or something like that. Basically confirming that Map Hat, game theory, film theory, or food theory exist in that universe, since he says it at the end of every video. But like. Do you think it's food theory? Cause that, that would be hilarious. He would have definitely done some theory on Fazbear Entertainment if it's actually food theory. Cause like, I mean, he tested Chuck E. Cheese pizza, right? So maybe the equivalent of that video in the FNAF universe is going to Freddy Fazbear's. I mean, that would be hilarious. I'd watch that, <laughs> even in that universe. But I mean, like he could probably get sued into the ground for that. Or maybe he'd just be the one that they also blame for their reputation like they did with Scott's equivalent in the universe. Who knows at this point? I don't, and I want answers. Number 10, Sister Location Intro. At the beginning of Sister Location, we get a major clue as to where the authorities are at when it comes to their views and suspicions surrounding William Afton. This is definitely something that is very noticeable, as it's dialogue over top of a cutscene showcasing close ups of Circus Baby. So, not super hidden, but it's also just something that I find doesn't get talked about a lot, so kind of hidden in that regard, if that makes sense. Maybe other people don't think it's a huge deal, but I think it's pretty important in regards to tracking William Afton's story. Based on the interrogation we are privy to, it seems as though William Afton might be the main suspect in a missing persons case, implying that the authorities are already onto him and may have even at some point caught him, or William simply went on the run after this and remained incognito for as long as necessary, as he was a wanted man. Either way, it sheds some important light on just how dangerous and potentially well known he is by the police in the FNAF universe. Makes you wonder how anything related to these animatronics could have ever been allowed to continue. Number 9, Lefty. Lefty is the animatronic that you can salvage or purchase in Pizzeria Simulator. We'd later learn that its initials were the clue to a dark secret that lurks within the animatronic, revealing that it is not alone or ever really kind of sentient on its own either. Lefty stands for Lure, Encapsulate, Fuse, Transport, and Extract. 
Act. Initially, you might think this refers to Lefty being an animatronic used for kidnapping and capturing the souls of innocent victims. And that could also be part of the meaning behind the acronym name, but it also happens to be the animatronic that contains within it the puppet who used Lefty to sneak into the pizzeria and resides within the animatronic. With this animatronic, you get two really for the price of one. It's definitely creepy, but also kind of efficient, at least for the purpose of collecting all the animatronics in order to free the souls trapped within them, which we find out it was actually our purpose this entire time. After all, the puppet is one of the animatronics whose soul does need to be freed. So yeah, let Charlie be free. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want us to discuss more hidden clues, secrets, and all those good, good bits of lore, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Every time you click that like, a new secret is revealed. It's true. Someone somewhere is reading something and it's like, oh, I figured out another piece of the puzzle. Number eight, The Immortal and the Restless. The Immortal and the Restless is the name of the soap opera that we get to watch on our time away from work in between shifts in Sister Location. And by we, I mean us playing as the protagonist, Eggs Benny, aka Michael Afton. The Immortal and the Restless is believed, however, to be more than just good old entertainment. Many fans believe it in itself is a hidden clue and illusion to the real world life of William Afton and Mrs. Afton. Real world life. Clara is meant to be a stand in for Mrs. Afton, and Vlad is meant to be a stand in for William, aka Mr. Afton. Vlad is cold and turns away from Clara, who insists that her son is actually his and the result of their love affair, but Vlad remains in denial. People think that this is meant to symbolize William Afton turning away from his family and his wife, thereby driving Clara, aka Mrs. Afton, away. It's unclear as to if he actually refused to acknowledge Michael as his own son, or if Mrs. Afton actually set the house that they lived in on fire, but most people think it's all meant to be more symbolic than literal. Number 7. Ness We all know Vanessa, who is supposed to be one of the principal characters in the newest FNAF game, Security Breach, but is Vanessa also Ness from the emails seen in the FNAF AR mobile game Special Delivery? It seems like the answer could be yes, based on the creepy context we see from these emails sent to her. It also seems to be implied in these emails that Ness or Vanessa if it is her, was a security transfer. Hmm. These hidden clues even give us an idea of Vanessa's date of birth, with her username in some emails being Nessie97, as in 1997 the year she was born. Number 6. Hidden Compartment Blueprints from Sister Location revealed this disturbing and hidden bit of lore. Through them, we learned of the hidden compartments within some animatronics chest cavities. Freddy had one and Circus Baby had one as well. And the other surprising fact is that we found these compartments because they seem to be full, or at least were imagined as being full in these blueprints. With the chest cavities or stomachs of these animatronics, we saw little bodies curled up into a fetal position. It seemed like these animatronics were indeed made for kidnapping unsuspecting and naive victims. Small, small victims. Number 5. Vanessa A. Another huge clue that came from the emails and special delivery seems to indicate that Vanessa could indeed somehow be related to the Afton family. That comes from an employee listing where we learn, like I said earlier, about her transfer. We are given the name Vanessa A there, and that one initial for her last name, A, sticks out like a sore thumb. What else begins with A, you ask? Only one of the most important surnames in all of FNAF lore, that of William and his family. Afton. This has led fans to believe that Vanessa could actually be Vanessa Afton and has some direct relation to the family tree. But the question remains, if Vanessa is an Afton, just how is she related to William and the gang? Number 4. Ballora's Song The fate of Mrs. Afton is something that has been alluded to a few times in the games, but something that has yet been undefined is who exactly she is. We don't even know her name, nor do we know exactly her relationship to William Afton. We assume that the two were romantically involved and have children. Part of the reason why we assume the romance is because of this clue. That is the animatronic, Ballora and her song. Ballora sings about missing someone who it seems has withdrawn into themselves. Before she and this person were once happy, but now they have shut her out and resigned themselves to loneliness, closing up. It is possible this song is meant to represent the separation that happened between William Afton and Mrs. Afton, or is meant to symbolize his grief over losing her. Number 3. 1997 plus 23 equals 2020 
Math! Another huge clue that we get from special delivery, with the help of some basic math of course, is the year in which security breach likely takes place. We can piece together that Nessie, Ness or Vanessa was born in 1997 based on our username. We then know that Vanessa A is listed as being 23 years old. And from there we can figure out, if we add those two numbers together, that if Vanessa is 23 in the present day, which we assume these emails are from, the security breach takes place in 2020, when Vanessa A would have likely gotten transferred and of course be 23. Now this could be a red herring and a security breach could be set in a different year, either in Vanessa's past or her future, or perhaps Vanessa from security breach is not Vanessa A or Ness at all from special delivery. But that would be a lot of weird coincidences and misleads when it comes to what appears to be pretty direct clues, if you piece them together. Number 2. Mrs. Afton's Fate? Mrs. Afton's fate has been a much debated topic. In fact, it's even been debated if Mrs. Afton ever existed at all. We are led to believe, however, based on the clues we gather along the way from the games and the books, that it is very likely that some version of her existed. Whether she was married to William Afton, or was only his girlfriend, or perhaps his one time lover. Mrs. Afton, or whatever her name might be, is believed to be the mother of William Afton's children. But we don't really know what happened to her after that. Did she leave William? Did she die? Did they get a divorce? In the book and story 1.35am from Fazbear Frights, we see an allusion to her with a connection to a line in Sister Location. Based on this story and that line, both of which potentially being clues, it seems as though Mrs. Afton may have actually died in Circus Baby's entertainment and rental in the Sister Location, possibly an event. The question is, was her death just a tragic yet unavoidable fate? Or were the animatronics responsible? Or was William perhaps himself behind it? If that is after all even what happened. Number 1. Evan Crying Child's place in the Afton family and even his very existence to some extent has been debated for quite some time, but recently we finally may have made a breakthrough in terms of understanding who he is as a character, or at the very least, what his name is. Based on a potentially solved puzzle from the survival logbook, we've been led to believe that Crying Child may in fact be named Evan. However, it is possible that this isn't the solution we were meant to find and that the puzzle still remains unsolved. But due to Evan being the name for a character who seemed to be the younger brother of Michael that appeared in Fazbear Fright's Blackbird story, The Real Jake, it seems like Evan may actually be the name and identity of Crying Child. Did we solve it? I think we solved it! In a 10 FNAF 4 house. Starting off with the most recent game in the series, Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted Curse of Dreadbear DLC. If you decide to take a break from all the spook, you are able to get some special views of the scenery that had quite a lot of effort put into it. They have special events like Dreadbear rising out of the blood red sea, hand walking into a barn behind you, Foxy ship swaying over that very same sea, and the ever so looming Dreadbear spawning giant sized over the hills. But finally, we can actually place where this Halloween festival is taking place. In the distance on the hill, you are able to see the silhouette of a very familiar house, the same silhouette that appears in Five Nights 4. This house is commonly believed to be the Afton's family residence, which implies some things that will be taken into account later in this list. There's a lot of help wanted stuff in here because everyone has already picked the other hidden secrets to shreds, so like I gotta use the new stuff. Like, it's, there's not really an option, except for number 9. IV, flowers, and pills. One of the most common theories about what is happening in Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is that what we are experiencing is happening in the mind of the crying child, who is laying in a hospital bed because of the bite and who will die at the end of the game. This theory was first brought on by the easter eggs of an IV, a vase of flowers, and a jar of pills that can be visible next to the child's bed when the screen is brightened, because we all know how much we love to brighten screens now. These are no doubt referencing the fact that we are just truly waiting in the hospital just approaching our deaths, thanks to the flatline we hear at the end of the game. This led to the idea that the whole game series is a dream and that you can play as the crying child in all of them, living out a life full of terror thanks to the animatronics that took your sister. And it ate Ultimate Custom FNAF World. This easter egg was pointed out by MatPat in one of his final timeline videos for Ultimate Custom Night, where he started the video spending 10 minutes downloading a fresh copy of both FNAF World and Ultimate Custom Night so that nothing had been unlocked yet. In FNAF World you were able to dive deep into
into the game's code and visit Old Man Consequences, who will say some things and then ultimately make you drown yourself because you need to get out. This reveals the secret ending of the game and gives you a trophy for it. In Ultimate Custom Night, you are able to visit Old Man Consequences as well, who tells you to leave the demon to his demons and rest your own soul. However, if you do this, you'll need to drown yourself again to leave the game. Doing this while never even playing a second of FNAF World will unlock the Old Man Consequences trophy, which is odd, but might be Scott's way of saying that the game is still canon. I mean, it did talk about sentient code and things in the game affecting the things in the real world since you lay out clues for FNAF 3, probably hinting at the fact that the game may be the key in solving the lore going forward. Since we're seeing the same sorts of things emerge, sentient code, games affecting the outside world, it's interesting and worth exploring further. I just don't have the time for it. And at 7, Consequences. In Ultimate Custom Night, if you put Old Man Consequences in at level 1 and play his mini game, you can end up visiting his pond like in FNAF World. However, while doing this, you can hear a very faint ambiance. While it may seem like normal Five Nights at Freddy's sounds at first, when sped up, it actually sounds like the distorted screams of a man. The sound goes from 2 minutes and 54 seconds to 18 seconds, and is commonly believed to be William Afton screaming in the deepest depths of hell since we're playing as him in Ultimate Custom Night. But this also means that Afton is an experienced experiencing the mini game with Old Man Consequences, so how are we able to see it? And who are we playing as in this pond? Probably Golden Freddy. Cassidy, the one you should not have killed, the one who is torturing Afton for all eternity in the deepest damnation of hell because they can't leave the demon to his demons and rest their own soul. Because while there may be nothing else, at least revenge is something, right? And it's 6 Endo. To find the secret, you'll need to play FNAF 2 and Help Wanted quite a bit. The fact that when you load the game, you can start off with an endoskeleton just standing in your office is honestly terrifying. And there are plenty of more secret animatronics in Help Wanted, like Helpy being behind the monitor. But he'd only get his own spot if he was buff Helpy because that would be scary. The fact that he doesn't do anything doesn't help either. We're supposed to believe that the other animatronics attack naked endoskeletons, but actually, they will leave this damn thing alone. Sure, it's because it's the first location we see in the game, so they haven't gotten that feature yet, but that just begs the question, why did they get that feature in the first place? Why did someone think it was needed for them to make this hideous beast their target? Why? Why was it required? Was it just because he was just like, oh, I'm just gonna stand around in the office, and they're like, no, get him out. I don't know. Oh. Halfway through number 5, Mini Rena and Biddy Bat. The mini arenas actually appear in Help Wanted. In the plush trap darkroom, you have the chance to see one of them in one of the doors, which is probably just a distraction tactic used by Scott just to get you to get jump scared. But it's still going to damn well work. And you can also encounter a Biddy Bap doll in Baby's mini game, where you need to close the closet door in the FNAF 4 house, but not for too long, otherwise the plush babies will kill you. Yeah, you can see the Biddy Bap near the door, and honestly, it's just freaky, especially because you can't look at it for too long, otherwise you, you baby jump scares you because you still gotta close the damn door. Also, has anyone completed the game using only flat mode? Because from what I've seen, the game is way harder that way. If you haven't completed the game using only flat mode, let me know in the comments, because congratulations. Holy damn. And at 4 Secret Audio. In the Corn Maze stage in the Curse of Dreadbear DLC, after collecting all 4 keys, you are able to find a 5th purple key, where if you find it, you are able to unlock the cellar in the middle of the map. If you do, you enter, finding a glitch trap bunny mask on the table of the barn you go to whenever you successfully complete a mission. Except this time, it's busted up and rotten. If you wear this mask in the main hub, which you can after unlocking it, you should hold the glitch trap plush you get after defeating him using the tape rolls instructions. If you do so, you hear some creepy audio of a one-sided conversation between a female and someone else. Most likely glitch trap since you know you need to be holding his plush. It seems as if she's preparing, making sure she is ready for something, and that she's made the mask. Perhaps she is waiting for his return. I mean, there was that female rabbit with a knife in one of the latest Freddy Fazbear promos. It's probably her, in all honesty. And at 3, Spring Bonnie. In Five Nights 3 on Cam 10, there is a poster of Freddy. This is the typical sight. However, you can rarely see a Spring Bonnie replacing the poster, showing a cartoonish version of the main antagonist of the game. While this could very well just be a golden bonnie, the fact that it appears in the game surrounding William Afton in the spring trap suit is enough cause to believe that this is meant to be Spring Bonnie. It's a cute poster if you ignore all the blood and decay surrounding it, but I mean, it's about everyone's favorite human in a suit that got a load of spring locks shoved into him yet somehow survived until Pizzeria Simulator where he ultimately burns to death in the worst parody of Blaze of Glory ever. At least he gets his comeuppance in Ultimate Custom Night where he is being tortured by the souls of the damned for all eternity. Or is he. This is actually really interesting, especially if Glitch Trap is Willie Afton. Where is this all gonna be if he gets out of the game? Like what?
Penultimately at number 2, Glitch Trap Dance. Again, heading to the Curse of Dreadbear DLC. While in black light mode, or hard mode as some call it, in the main menu, if you press the button on the back of the monitor and look at the car with its headlights on for around 10 seconds, this can trigger the sight of Glitch Trap dancing at the top of the hill near the FNAF 4 house. This seems to be pointing to the highly believed theory that Glitch Trap is William Afton, who saved his consciousness in circuit boards, who has been brought back to life in Help Wanted. This could also answer the question of whose car is sitting there. It could be the players, but they they acknowledge how the game is a game, so why would the car be yours? The fact that you need to look at the car indicates to me that it is William Afton's car, the one we see him kill Henry's kid in in FNAF 2, and the one he drives in Midnight Motorist. That's what it seems like to me, and to several others as well, so there you go. Finally, in a number one. It's me. There was only one person who was able to see this easter egg to my knowledge, and it involves getting the Curse of Dreadbear DLC and completing the game to be taken to the victory screen. There you will find three posters reminiscent of the ones in the alleyway in Pizzeria Simulator. However, the issue arises when you realize that to be able to unlock this easter egg, you need to get three clown posters, which is incredibly rare. And I mean like, incredibly rare. Plus, then you need to hit them with darts, which you only get four of, and if you miss two of them, you're screwed. So be sure you get your skills up to par before actually finding these posters. If you do manage to do this, the barn changes to seemingly a blacklight version, where the banner changes to read it's me and everything starts glowing because of the blacklight. While this hasn't been completed by more than Johnny Blocks from what I've seen, it may still be true, but I mean he did also do that and then get three cat posters like immediately after, so he might have been hacking. I'll have to look into it on my own to see if it's real. It would take a long time though.